Well, it's great to be here. I would just say, before we go any further, uh, I can't believe these lectures are going to be lost to the world. And I would just think we should pay tribute to Julian. Uh, absolutely. And the great thing he's given us is a formula. Uh, and one of the things I do is promote open data and open innovation. And so just take the idea and take it further is one thing I think we should take from today. So I'm going to be talking about artificial intelligence, myth and reality. There is a lot of chatter about AI. Um, people get confused. They imagine that we're busy in our labs building artificial brains that are every bit as powerful as the neural networks that drive our minds. They're not, <laughs> as I will endeavor to show. And they're not going to be waking up anytime soon and deciding we're a nuisance and removing us from the scene. The thing you must remember is not to fear artificial intelligence, but fear natural stupidity. <laughs> because it is people that inevitably and usually pose the existential threat to ourselves. So, why isn't the world going to be full of mad, bad and dangerous to know robots? The kind of thing that is built and exemplified by the wonderful Kubrick film, How? The very paranoid robot. And indeed, there's this wonderful definition, the myth. In fact, AI was once described as the art of making computers that behave like the ones in the movies. <laughs> bad idea. Um, they're either sad or they're very bad and dangerous to know. But the other point to recognize is that actually AI is everywhere. And we, it's not self-aware and thinking about whether we should or shouldn't continue to exist. It is just the product of thousands of hours of ingenious, audacious work by AI researchers, computer scientists, to make computers a little bit smarter. So the phones in your pockets, the supercomputers we now carry around, the things to which you can speak, that give you results back, that can tell you more than just a search term, can tell you something about when Michelangelo was born and died. Try it with your Google. It's just phenomenal. It's everywhere. It's everywhere and it's embedded. And this is not a shout out for any particular technology, but it is the case that programs can begin to anticipate our needs, not because they think anything about us, but because we can imagine the patterns of behavior that lead to predictable anticipation of what we might do next. And whether or not Google Glass or some variant will be the success of tomorrow or the near future, there will be increasing amounts of smart embedded software in our lives. It's already busily hoovering our rooms, rumba, robots. They're very well suited to those kind of very rectilinear rooms in the American suburban dream. They really are shit in your average kind of house cottage in the Cotswold. And they don't get upstairs very well either. They will also perform robotic surgery on you, and they're extremely good at precisely aligning to the particular images that medicine has delivered, again, using AI methods and techniques to recognize tumors, to recognize the outline of the soft tissue and the bone structure. These things are now tackling very hard problems. And by and large, all of this went largely unremarked, so the search terms that give you the wonderful panels of additional information, huge amounts of AI working to do routine, boring stuff like take Wikipedia, spot the facts in there, represent it in a very charming and customized way. So I type in, when was Michelangelo born? I'm not just searching, I'm actually posing a query. Back comes a structured result. That is the meat and drink of most AI, routine information finding. They don't have an opinion about it, those programs. They do what they're programmed to do. All went largely unremarked until, well, actually until 
an extraordinarily famous scientist started to get worried. Stephen Hawking reported as worrying when he got his latest, greatest speech recognition device, and indeed a system that did predictive um, analysis of what they thought Stephen might be trying to say. And indeed, that world of anticipative software has gotten very good. It kind of spooked him out. And spooking out is what a lot of these programs can do, as we shall see. And from that comment and observation that these machines were getting smart, it seemed to, to Professor Hawking, there was this huge slew of news. AI is an existential threat to humanity. And I've spent a good bit of the last year just kind of saying, you know what? Let's get this in context. What is it about AI that should make us fearful? And indeed, it's still the stuff of Hollywood. So ex machina or the latest kind of AI blockbusters often feature a self-aware machine or a machine that's struggling in the face of its own sentience. So what is the reality? The reality is driven by, it's by exponents. Now exponents are an interesting idea. It's the, often talked about exponentially fast. Very few things in the world change like that. But in computing, the power at our disposal does change like that. It's a log, log law, powers of 10. It means that about every 15 months, the computers get roughly twice as powerful and cost half as much for the equivalent power. The densities in terms of memory encoding double at about the same rates. The rates we can transmit the information double at about the same rates. Had we managed in an area like air transport to be exponential, you'd be flying from here to Sydney in a quarter of a second. This has not happened in most areas of science and engineering. It has literally happened in computing. And this stuff produces spooky results. Has done recently and has done in previous decades. I've been researching AI for all of my career. And when I began that career, in the only department of artificial intelligence in Europe, up in Edinburgh, we were told by our professors, no machine, no machine will ever beat the world champion chess player. This was absolutely authoritatively communicated by the best professors in the field. We knew Moore's law, we knew this doubling of power, even back then, but we couldn't foresee the consequences that just about 20 years later, in 1996, Garry Kasparov was unnerved by the machine in front of him. Deep Blue beat him first in one match and then in an entire tournament in the following year by searching unnaturally large numbers of moves ahead. Hundreds of millions of positions being searched by the supercomputer of the time. A, super, a supercomputer that I should say is now simply off the shelf white goods from Dixon's, okay? And Kasparov came to believe that that machine was reading his mind, was anticipating his moves. It had so much look ahead capability that he endowed it with powers that simply weren't there. You open up Deep Blue and you see extraordinary computing power for the time, big databases full of opening moves, massive look ahead, and the machine played chess in no way like the human chess master plays. Our software, our wetware runs much slower, is much more subtle, much more connected. We don't look millions of moves ahead. One of the great lessons to learn in AI was a beautiful saying from a professor at MIT, Pat Winston, said to me, 
there's lots of ways of being smart that aren't smart like us. And that's true in a very deep sense. They'll never be self-aware, and they aren't playing chess like we play chess. But that software now, the best software programs are way beyond any chess, chess master's rating. So that was 10 years ago. And 10 years, I remember in 1996, there was all sorts, 20 years ago, all sorts of you know, horror stories. The imminent rise of AI, the machines are about to overtake, the pinnacle of human problem solving had been washed aside by a machine. The end is nigh. They didn't. They haven't. Just last year, we saw the latest extraordinary developments in AI. So you're going to see now the retro arcade games from the 70s. You remember, you move the paddles and you try and hit the ball back. So this is a machine learning method that after 10 minutes of training is completely hopeless at the game. Can't work out what to do, can't control the paddles, socks. But this machine learning method can take the patterns represented by that density of information and work out associations. Two hours later, this machine is playing as well as any human expert. Which is already quite impressive. We'll come on to the how it does it shortly, but that's quite impressive. But some really spooky stuff happens after four hours. And this is the kind of stuff that has unnerved a lot of people. This program has learned from nothing in four hours with its machine learning algorithm to play at a superhuman level of capability. It works out the smart thing is to tunnel through the back and let the ball bounce and do the bricks. It is suitably impressive that Google paid tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars for the British company that developed that. And people stand there and they are feared. <laughs> if a machine can do this, what can't a machine do? The truth is that the actual architecture behind the, uh, the technique there is a recurrent neural network with some really interesting bells and whistles. In other words, it's learning by taking a representation of that game world as an n by n matrix. Every state on every position in every frame of that game is being internalized and represented, and the correlations that match between a successful performance of moving a panel and getting a ball back is being encoded. And it learns very quickly using this architecture and the power of the machines we now have. We've known about recurrent networks for decades. We've never had machines powerful enough to implement them in the way we can now. And with some interesting additional methods where the states that represent meaningful waypoints in solving the problem are also represented. The spooky thing about this, I should say, is that I can show you the neural imaging. This is the brain scan of deep, of deep mind's algorithm. You can actually see in the representation of the neural network parts of the network that encode for particular positions, particular circumstances in the game. But isn't going to wake up tomorrow and decide that you are a problem. That game-playing super capability can't transfer to a game of chess, or a game of tiddlywinks, or a game of Cluedo. We build exquisite, narrow AI systems. But what this whole thing has done is hugely important. Hawking and uh, others who have called our attention to this have paid a great service to the field because they've asked us to think about the ethics of what 
power we give to machines. And the realization of that is absolutely in this technology. So these drones that are now flying about with large amounts of AI software on them to locate their targets, to actually navigate to a position, to automatically control and stabilize the flight platform, to fire the weapon, these are terrifying new capabilities. We live in an age where AI has become a dual-use technology. It's not new, happened to biology, biological weapons, happened to chemistry, chemical weapons, happened to nuclear physics, nuclear weapons, nuclear power, chemistry, lots of things manufactured, biology, lots of antibiotics manufactured, dual use. We will have to start thinking about the statutes and treaties, the understandings of regulation that will have to happen with these new weapons of destruction. We have to ask ourselves whether we're happy to give the entire chain of command over to an automated drone. And we'll have to ask those same questions about driverless vehicles, about our robotic surgeons. They're not self-aware, but they are highly capable systems whose existence poses material questions, ethical questions, whether it's in automated financial trading, health, transport, or making war. My real interest is actually in a new kind of AI that I see emerging as well. This isn't artificial intelligence, it's augmented intelligence. It is the fact that we, with our machines, can now solve problems at scale that neither machine nor human can solve. Great example here, this is a project where they're using AI programs to try and trace out the neural connections in real human brain scans. The software isn't brilliant at it. The humans come along and improve the mapping. Thousands of examples where people's machines, data and algorithms together can solve problems and augment each other's capabilities. And I leave you with the following. This is my lovely boy. Can you this piece where that goes on the picture? 10 years ago. There. Okay. He was three. Picture? He's done a piece of task transfer. Machines on three green bricks. That general intelligence is years away from understanding. If AI has taught me anything in the decades I've studied it, it is a stand in absolute awe of the human neural system to be absolutely absorbed and impressed by our cognitive abilities. These machines are our tools and artifacts, and we need to make sure that as this technology advances, our natural stupidity is trumped by our intrinsic ingenuity and intelligence to make the technology work for us. Thank you.